Hello, in this video I'd like to talk about quantifier elimination. So suppose that we're looking at the first order logic of a particular structure and we happen to be in this really fortunate situation where every time we have some formula phi involving quantifiers, we can turn it into an equivalent formula rho that doesn't have any quantifiers in it. We say that a first order logical theory has quantifier elimination uh, if every time we have some sort of formula that has uh, potentially some free variables in it, we can convert it into some equivalent quantifier free formula that has those same free variables. Of course, this is trivially true if there are no free variables in this formula. If this formula here is a sentence, then it's either true or false within our particular context. Uh, and so we can just uh, translate it into the equivalent, uh, either truth or falsehood. It's perfectly fine when dealing with first order logic to add in a constant for truth and falsehood, uh, T and F, constants that just represent statements which are trivially true and trivially false. Of course, the question of how to translate a formula with no free variables uh, into the corresponding either truth or falsehood constant uh, determining which of those constants to translate it into to make it equivalent, well, that's, I mean, that's the same as just determining whether or not the sentence was true or false. We need a, a way of really understanding what's true and what's false in this particular theory. The hope is that if we have some sort of algorithm for turning any formula into a corresponding quantifier-free formula, and we feed that algorithm uh, a sentence, a formula with no free variables, uh, that algorithm should spit out a corresponding quantifier-free, uh, free variable-free uh, formula, which uh, might just be true or false, or might be some sort of uh, basic assertion about the constants of the structure, uh, and then we can just analyze whether or not that's true by understanding how the constants are related to each other. So having a quantifier elimination procedure gives us a really good handle on deciding what sentences are true and false. It also gives us a really good handle on what we can say in this particular logic. Right? If we have some sort of predicate, some sort of uh, property that's true of some tuple of elements of our structure, uh, and that property is some sort of first order logical formula, uh, potentially a very complicated first order logical formula. We can use the quantifier elimination procedure to reduce that formula down to a quantifier free formula. And it's much easier to analyze what sorts of quantifier free formulas can we build up out of the most basic atomic formulas and then combining them together using Boolean logic. Especially in light of our disjunctive normal form, we can take this quantifier free formula that we wound up getting via our translation and put that formula in disjunctive normal form uh, and it will still be equivalent uh, and then we really know what it looks like, right? It's the or of a bunch of ands of basic atomic formulas and their negations. In order to prove that a particular theory has quantifier elimination, all we really need to do is prove that we can eliminate a single quantifier. Suppose that we have some sort of formula of the form there exists an x such that uh, some, something is true involving x uh, and then a bunch of other variables, y0 through yn. And this phi here uh, doesn't have any quantifiers in it. So this is just a formula here that has one quantifier. And suppose that we could turn it into an equivalent formula with no quantifiers uh, of just the free variables of this uh, formula, y0 through yn. If we have this particular reduction process, we can work our way through a formula that has lots of quantifiers, working from the inside out. And every time we encounter a quantifier, we can just get rid of it uh, using this particular procedure. At least if it's a there exists quantifier. If we have a for all quantifier, we're going to have to translate this into the equivalent. There does not exist a counterexample. And then here, 
we have an existential quantifier applied to some formula that uh, let's assume this doesn't have any quantifiers in it. So we can use the same sort of algorithm to turn this bit into a quantifier free formula. And then of course, well, when we, we add a negation on, on the front of it, it's still a quantifier free formula. So we work our way from the inside out and every time we encounter an existential quantifier or a universal quantifier, we use this algorithm to get rid of that quantifier and that will get rid of all of the quantifiers in our particular formula, giving us a very algorithmic way of turning a formula with quantifiers in it into an equivalent quantifier free formula. Let's look at a concrete example. Suppose I have the formula, there exists an x such that ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero. This formula here has three free variables, a, b, and c, and depending on the value of those variables, it can either be true or false. Whether this formula is true or false also depends on the particular structure we're looking at. Let's say for a moment that we're looking at the complex numbers. Well, when does a polynomial like this have a solution in the complex numbers? Well, the only situation where it doesn't have a solution is going to be when this polynomial is actually some non-zero constant, right? When this is zero and this is zero and this is non-zero, um, and, and then we have something like two is equal to zero or i is equal to zero, and there's no solution. There's, there's no x that makes that happen. Otherwise, there's going to be a solution. That's kind of the nice thing about complex numbers is that we can always find uh, solutions to polynomial equations. So over the complex numbers, this formula is equivalent to, it's not the case that a is equal to zero and b is equal to zero and c is not equal to zero. So we were able to take this formula here with again, three free variables and one quantified variable and get rid of that quantified variable to find an equivalent statement. When is it the case that there's going to exist an X that makes this true? Well, it's going to happen in this case here. And it turns out this isn't a special case. This particular structure here has quantifier elimination. Any sort of formula that we could imagine constructing uh, of, within the first order logic of this particular complex numbers with addition and multiplication uh, can be translated into an equivalent formula in just the free variables that doesn't have any quantifiers in it. On the other hand, suppose we're working within the real numbers with addition and multiplication. This formula here is equivalent to well, this is something that I teach in college algebra. Uh, this happens when, when a is not equal to zero, we require that b squared minus 4ac is greater than or equal to zero, the discriminant test for quadratic polynomials. And of course, if a is equal to zero, then we require that b is not equal to zero or c is equal to zero. But here's the clever thing. This is not a formula in the first order logic of this structure here, right? We don't have less than or equal to. We can define less than or equal to, right? We can define that x is less than or equal to y in this structure here if uh, y is equal to x plus z squared for some z but it's not part of the structure. And in order to define it, we need a quantifier. And there's no way around this, right? We need to somehow be able to express this inequality and there's no way to directly express that inequality in this structure without quantifiers. And so we say that this structure here does not have quantifier elimination, but we can modify it, adding in the less than or equal to relation uh, and then suddenly, well, maybe it does have quantifier elimination. Uh, certainly this formula can be translated into an equivalent uh, formula without any quantifiers. Uh, and it turns out that any formula uh, in this particular first order logic can be translated into an equivalent formula uh, in, uh, without quantifiers in the first order logic. So one of the things that tends to happen with quantifier elimination is that uh, we are interested in adding things onto a structure in order to give them 
quantifier elimination. We start off with a structure that doesn't have quantifier elimination yet, uh, that we can't translate formulas with quantifiers into equivalent quantifier-free ones, and then figure out, well, what, what basic things can we add to the structure in order to give them quantifier elimination? Of course, if we're allowing ourselves to add in new relations to a structure in order to be able to get quantifier elimination, if we get carried away with this process, it's really trivial to give any structure quantifier elimination. Suppose that we have some sort of formula, phi, with three variables, x0 through xn, and this formula here has some quantifiers in it. Then we can create a new relation on our structure, which I'm going to call r sub phi, uh, and this is, this is just a brand new symbol, just like this less than or equal to symbol, and it winds up being equivalent uh, to this formula here, uh, by definition, by construction. Well, then we were able to take this formula phi and translate it into not just a quantifier-free formula, but an atomic formula, right? This r sub phi is an atomic relation that we added into our structure, uh, and it's equivalent. It's logically equivalent because we said it was. Ah, uh, well, uh, that's kind of useless, right? Our goal with quantifier elimination was to be able to analyze what's true and what's false of our structure to be able to analyze the expressivity of our structure. And this has translated the process of understanding a particular formula uh, that has quantifiers in it to understanding that exact same formula that has quantifiers in it. Uh, so it really doesn't help us to just keep throwing in stuff to our structure until we get quantifier elimination. We have to make sure that we retain some intuition about the zeroth order logic of the structure the quantifier-free formulas that we have in the particular structure. And that's fine. Uh, for this uh, case here, adding in less than or equal to, we have a really good intuition for how less than or equal to works, and we have a good intuition for how less than or equal to works in combination with addition and multiplication and the things that we can construct by combining addition and multiplication together, that is, polynomials. So our goal with quantifier elimination is always to add in very little stuff to the structure in order to give it quantifier elimination, assuming it doesn't have quantifier elimination to begin with, uh, like we did in the complex numbers case. Let's focus in on the case where we're looking at the complex numbers, along with addition, subtraction, multiplication, and constants for 0 and 1. I'd like to prove that this structure here has quantifier elimination. That is, any formula with any number of quantifiers in it can be translated into an equivalent formula with no quantifiers in it. And of course, in order to do this, all we have to do is show that we can eliminate one existential quantifier. Let's say that we have a formula that looks like there exists an x such that something is true and this something here is quantifier-free. That is to say, it's, it's just some sort of application of and, or, and not, the Boolean operations, uh, to uh, atomic formulas. Because this bit of the formula here is a zeroth order logical formula, we can translate it into disjunctive normal form. So this is going to be equivalent to, there exists an x such that an or of a bunch of smaller pieces. And each of these pieces is going to be a conjunction, an AND, of atomic and negated atomic formulas. One of the key properties of the existential quantifier, uh, because it corresponds to just taking a really large OR over the entire structure, um, it commutes uh, with uh, individual ORs. And so this formula here is actually logically equivalent to for one of these pieces here, it's going to be the case that there exists an x that makes that piece true. And so actually, all we need in order to turn this formula into a quantifier-free formula is a way to turn 
this formula into a quantifier-free formula, and this formula into a quantifier-free formula, and this formula into a quantifier-free formula. All the different formulas here, we turn them into quantifier-free formulas, and then we take the or, or together, all of those resulting formulas to get a larger quantifier-free formula that's equivalent to what we had before. So all we need is the ability to turn formulas of the form there exists an x such that all of these pieces here were ands, conjunctions of atomics and negative atomic formulas. All we need is the ability to turn these sorts of formulas into equivalent quantifier-free formulas. So what does it actually look like to take the conjunction of atomic and negative atomic formulas? This structure doesn't have any relations to it. So the only way of constructing atomic formulas is by using the built-in relation of equality. And we're going to have on the left-hand side of that equality some sort of term, and on the right-hand side of the equality some sort of term built up out of the constants 0, 1, and whatever variables we have involved, and the operations addition, subtraction, and multiplication. As we saw previously, the only things that we can build up from variables and 0 and 1 using addition, subtraction, and multiplication are equivalent to polynomials on those particular variables. So we have some sort of polynomial on the left is equal to some sort of polynomial on the right. But of course, because we have subtraction, we can turn this into the equivalent some polynomial, specifically the difference between these two polynomials, is equal to zero. And so while we might have really complicated atomic formulas, we can, using a very straightforward process, translate any of those atomic formulas into some polynomial is equal to zero. And of course, the negations of those atomic formulas, well, it's just going to be some polynomial is not equal to zero. And so when we take the conjunction of these atomic formulas and their negations, we have the big conjunction. Think of this as like a summation, but it's instead of adding things together, we're anding things together. We're anding together the statement that a bunch of different polynomials uh, in x are uh, bound variable and then our free variables y0 through yn uh, are equal to zero uh, and uh, a bunch of polynomials uh, qi are not equal to zero. This is it. All we need to do is show that formulas of this form can be translated into equivalent formulas that don't have any quantifiers in them. And that will suffice to prove quantifier elimination for our entire structure. We can actually reduce this even further by translating this into an equivalent, well, if we have a bunch of polynomials are equal to zero, if there's some value of x that makes a bunch of polynomials equal to zero, how can we uh, find a value of x that makes all of them equal to zero? Well, it's going to have to make the greatest common factor of all of those polynomials equal to zero. When we consider them as polynomials uh, in x whose coefficients are polynomials in y0 through yn. There's a few important things to note here. Uh, first of all, we can compute the greatest common factor of a bunch of polynomials in an algorithmic way. So uh, this process here is still something that you could carry out on a computer, which is important if you care about actually uh, studying the first order logic of this structure on a computer. The other thing that we have to make sure is that when we calculate this GCF, we genuinely do get a polynomial uh, in the variables here. And we actually don't. Um, we get various different polynomials depending on whether certain combinations of the coefficients uh, wind up giving us zero. We were able to uh, take this conjunction, this and of all of these polynomials being equal to zero, and turn it roughly into uh, a single polynomial is equal to zero. And then of course if we want to require that a bunch of polynomials are not equal to zero, 
That's really straightforward. That we just say that uh, a single polynomial, the product of these polynomials is unequal to zero. And of course, if all of these are polynomials in x uh, and y0 through yn, then uh, the product is of course going to be a polynomial in x and y0 through yn. So let's remember that we're trying to convert a formula of this form. There exists an x such that one polynomial is equal to zero and another polynomial is unequal to zero into just a formula on these variables here, these free variables y0 through yn. So again, the question is, is there a condition on the y0 through yn such that there is an x that makes p of x equal to zero, but doesn't make q of x equal to zero? That is, there's some root that p of x has that q of x does not have. This would be really easy if we could write these polynomials in factored form. But there's a few obstacles in the way. First of all, we would have to write uh, the a and the r's. Um, this, this here isn't just a pure polynomial in x with numerical coefficients. This is a polynomial in x with coefficients involving y0 through yn. The coefficients are going to be polynomials in y0 through yn. And so uh, a is going to involve y0 through yn, and the roots are going to involve y0 through yn. Uh, and the exponents are somehow going to involve uh, y0 through yn, uh, it's going to be gross. There's no really nice way of, of breaking it apart like this. But assuming we could do that, all we're doing is to check to see if there's some root here that doesn't also show up here, right? If there's some root to this polynomial that doesn't show up as a root to this polynomial. If these exponents were one, this would be really easy to check. All we would have to do is check to see if this polynomial divides into this polynomial. And in that case, every single term, and again, we're assuming it has degree one, is also going to show up over here. And so if this divided into this, then every term we saw over here would divide into a corresponding term over here. And we can tell if one polynomial divides into another polynomial just by doing some long multiplication to give us some Boolean conditions on the coefficients. Let's say we wanted to figure out if x minus r divides evenly into x squared plus bx plus c. Well, we just do our polynomial long division. In other words, x minus r divides evenly into x squared plus bx plus c if the remainder c plus br plus r squared, which is really what we get if we plug r into this original polynomial in the first place, um, is zero. And so while polynomial long division can be a little bit tedious, it's a process that can be carried out on a computer. And in particular, we can get some sort of condition, that is whenever the remainder is equal to zero, that tells us when one polynomial divides evenly into another polynomial. The problem is these exponents here might not be one. It might not be enough to determine whether this polynomial here divides evenly into this polynomial here. We have to go a little bit further, but not that much further. Uh, it turns out if we take this polynomial here and raise it to a power that's at least uh, these uh, exponents here, uh, then all we have to do is check whether or not this polynomial divides evenly into this polynomial. That is, here we just have to check if p evenly divides q raised to the power of the degree of p, considered as a polynomial in x. If we take q, which is a polynomial, and raise it to this concrete power, we're just going to get another polynomial. And again, we can check if one polynomial divides evenly into another polynomial just by doing polynomial long division. That'll give us a condition on the coefficients. And the coefficients, of course, are polynomials in y0 through yn. 
So we just have a nice Boolean condition on these coefficients. And of course, if p evenly divides q to the degree of p, uh, then there actually isn't an x that makes this equal to zero and this not equal to zero. So actually we want to negate that divisibility check. But again, we can turn this negation of a check of divisibility into some Boolean combination of polynomial equations in y0 through yn, which is exactly what we were looking for, exactly the equivalent that we were trying to translate this original formula into. Right, so we were able to turn this formula here into some sort of Boolean combination of polynomial equations on the coefficients, which is exactly the quantifier-free formula in this first order logic, uh, in, in the zeroth order part of that first order logic, um, that we were looking for. And this suffices to prove that any first order logical formula uh, in this particular theory uh, can be translated into an equivalent quantifier-free formula. So this tells us a few things. First of all, it gives us a procedure for determining whether any first order logical formula uh, in this structure is true. If we have some sort of really complicated formula just involving complex numbers, addition, subtraction, multiplication, zero and one, polynomials, very basic stuff. If we have some sort of complicated formula there, uh, we can run it into a computer and determine whether or not it's true. And in fact, there's actually a great deal of research work being put into uh, making sure that this quantifier elimination algorithm is as efficient as possible, both in terms of the amount of time that it takes to eliminate a quantifier, and also in terms of the overall complexity of the result that we get uh, when we do this quantifier elimination. If we can keep those things low, um, we can actually practically determine whether certain formulas uh, uh, in the first order logic of the complex numbers are true or false. You can even go a step further and have the computer spit out a proof for you that this particular formula is true or false. I'd like to contrast this with taking a look at what happens when we replace the complex numbers with the natural numbers. We saw this before when we were studying the first order logic of the natural numbers with addition and multiplication. Uh, we could create formulas that encoded the operation of computer programs. And so in order to determine whether that particular formula was true or false, we had to solve the halting problem for that particular computer program. And so there wasn't a general algorithm for determining whether a particular formula in the first order logic of the natural numbers with addition and multiplication was true or false. So this is a bit counterintuitive because you would think of the complex numbers as being a more complicated structure and therefore harder to study. But it turns out that the complex numbers in terms of their first order logic uh, are actually easier to study than the natural numbers. And I think a decent intuition behind this goes as follows. When we're dealing with the natural numbers, we're interested in determining whether certain polynomial equations, let's say, uh, have uh, natural number solutions to them. And that turns out to be really difficult, especially when there are many variables involved. If there's just one variable involved, we can just find an upper bound for the solution, if there is any, and just kind of brute force search our way up to there. Um, but if we have multiple variables involved, it gets a lot more complicated. On the other hand, if we're interested in whether or not a polynomial has a solution over the complex numbers, the answer is yes, it always has a solution. That's the whole point of complex numbers is that every polynomial uh, has a root, uh, well, except for constant uh, non-zero polynomials. But otherwise, the whole point of complex numbers was that we wanted to add in roots to all of the polynomials. Specifically, we added in a root to the polynomial x squared plus one is equal to zero. And then it just so happened that for free, uh, we got roots to every other polynomial as well. So determining whether or not there exists an x making an atomic formula in this first order logic true uh, is really straightforward. The other thing that we get is an understanding of the expressivity of the first order logic of the complex numbers is this structure here. 
If we have a complicated first order logical formula, we can translate it into an equivalent, uh, potentially quite complicated, um, zeroth order logical formula in conjunctive normal form. And we have a pretty good intuition of what subsets of uh, n tuples of complex numbers are given by atomic formulas or their negations. Right? These are going to define some subsets of high dimensional space, uh, uh, you know, the x0 through xn, the complex numbers x0 through xn that satisfy this particular polynomial equation. Uh, and we can also talk about the complement of that subset. Uh, and that's going to be given by uh, this formula here. If we AND together or OR together, uh, those types of subsets, well, that just corresponds to taking intersections and unions of the basic sets that we've defined. And so that's kind of all that we can define uh, using uh, Boolean combinations of atomic formulas in this structure. And we said that every first order logical formula was equivalent to some Boolean combination. And so the only subsets of this high dimensional complex space that we can describe are going to be uh, given by some Boolean combination in terms of unions and intersections and complements uh, of these really basic uh, some polynomial is equal to zero subsets of that high dimensional space. This gives us a really good handle on what we can express in this logic. I also want to quickly talk about uh, how we can show that the real numbers with addition, subtraction, multiplication, 0, 1, and less than or equal to has quantifier elimination. That is, any first order logical formula in this particular structure can be translated into an equivalent zeroth order logical formula. Intuitively, we expect this process to be a bit trickier. If we want to determine whether or not a particular polynomial has complex solutions, uh, we pretty much always just say yes. Um, but if we want to know if a polynomial has real solutions, it's going to be a little bit trickier to find out. Uh, unless, of course, the polynomial is odd degree, in which case the answer is also yes. And remember that we had to add this less than or equal to in in the first place in order to answer some really simple questions like, does there exist an x such that x squared is equal to y? Well, uh, this depends on whether y is greater than or equal to zero. In fact, this is equivalent to y is greater than or equal to zero. And so in order to eliminate this quantifier here from this very specific formula, we need to add in a greater than or equal to sign uh, in order to get this to work. So in order to prove that this structure has quantifier elimination, again, we go through that same process. Uh, we just want to eliminate a single uh, existential quantifier from some basic formula like this, where this piece here is quantifier free. We again convert this into disjunctive normal form. And so we have something like this, which we can translate into something like this, where each one of these uh, pieces here is simply a conjunction, an and, of a bunch of atomic formulas and their negations. And so really all we need to do is be able to eliminate this quantifier here from a conjunction of atomic formulas. And again, it's going to look something like uh, some polynomial is equal to zero. Um, but then we can also say that some polynomials are not equal to zero. And then we can also say that a bunch of other polynomials are greater than or equal to zero, and some more polynomials are not greater than or equal to zero, or equivalently, strictly less than zero. And so suddenly we're stuck with finding whether or not there's a particular x that makes some polynomials equal to zero, some polynomials not equal to zero, some polynomials non-negative, and some polynomials negative. Uh, uh, and just figure that out by doing some Boolean logic on the coefficients, which again are going to be polynomials. If we view these polynomials as polynomials in x, they're going to be polynomials whose coefficients are 
polynomials in y0 through yn. This process is trickier, but it turns out to be incredibly well studied because it turns out being able to answer uh, first order logical questions about this particular structure has a lot of concrete real world applications. We can, for instance, describe geometric configurations as real polynomial equations uh, in the coordinates of points. And so we can turn questions about whether certain geometric configurations exist in uh, three-dimensional space or higher dimensional space uh, into just first order logical questions and then answer them using our algorithm for answering first order logical questions. I don't want to go through the complete proof in this video. I'll link to some resources down below where you can read more, but I do want to show you a really neat theorem that plays an important role in answering these sorts of questions uh, and proving uh, this particular quantifier elimination result. So Sturm's theorem says that, suppose that we have some sort of real polynomial, and we construct the following sequence. The first term of the sequence is the polynomial itself, uh, the second term of the sequence is the derivative of that polynomial, and then after that, each term of the sequence is negative the remainder uh, when we divide the term two terms back uh, by the polynomial one term back. And then we keep doing this until we have a constant polynomial. If we have a particular number x and plug it into, each element of the sequence is going to be a polynomial in x. And if we plug in a particular x into all of these different polynomials, we're going to get concrete numbers uh, that are either going to be positive, negative, or zero. And let's let v of x be the number of sign alternations, ignoring zeros, uh, when we plug in this particular value of x into the sequence including we can make sense of v of infinity and v of negative infinity by looking at the limit of each of these polynomials as x approaches infinity and negative infinity. Then, and we need to do something a little bit tricky if a or b uh, is actually a root of the polynomial, um, but otherwise um, if we want to determine the number of distinct real roots of our original polynomial within this interval from a to b, uh, we just need to compute v of a minus v of b. And so what this can do is give us a Boolean combination of conditions on the coefficients of p uh, in order to give it roots in particular regions. Let's do a concrete example. Let's say that we want to determine how many roots x squared plus bx plus c has uh, within uh, the interval from zero to infinity. And as instructed, we need to handle separately the case where c is equal to zero um, when zero is actually a root of this original polynomial. We need to use a slightly more sophisticated version of the theorem in order to analyze that case. Um, but just analyzing this polynomial here, uh, the first term is the polynomial, the second term is the derivative, which is 2x plus b. Even though derivatives involve this complicated limit process, uh, calculating the derivative of a polynomial uh, is really quite straightforward, uh, and the coefficients uh, wind up only being polynomials in the coefficients of the original polynomial. So uh, we don't get a really complicated result when we take the derivative, and we can do this easily algorithmically. And then the last term of this sequence is going to be the remainder when we divide this polynomial by this, uh, negative that remainder. Remember that Sturm's theorem requires us to analyze if we plug in uh, these particular x's, if we plug in zero and we plug, plug in infinity, uh, into each of these polynomials here, uh, what sort of sign alternation are we going to see in the result? Well, let's, uh, let's do that plugging in. If we plug in zero into these polynomials here, we're going to get 
And if we plug in infinity into these uh, polynomials here, uh, the result, right, if we take the limit of this polynomial as x goes to infinity, uh, the result only depends on the leading coefficient. Uh, so this limit's going to be positive, and this limit is also going to be positive, because this coefficient is positive. And then the result here depends on the sign of this expression here. Let's break this up into several cases in order to analyze the sign alternation of these two sequences here. If b is positive and c is positive, then it's positive, positive, well, who knows, and positive, positive, ah, the same who knows. And so regardless of whether b squared over 4 minus c is positive or negative, the number of sign alternations that we get uh, is going to be the same. And so the difference in sign alternations is going to be zero. Uh, remember that we can skip the case where c is equal to zero. We need to handle that slightly separately. If b is positive and c is negative, uh, then we have negative positive something, positive positive, that same thing. Uh, and so there's going to be one more sign alternation going from here to here uh, that we don't get over here, but we get the same sign alternation or lack of sign alternation going from here to here. So the difference is one. And in this case, we expect a root between zero and infinity. If b is equal to zero and c is positive, then uh, this term here is necessarily negative. So what do we get? We get positive, zero, negative, and positive, positive, negative. Uh, we, remember that we ignore zeros, so there's one sign alternation, and there's also one sign alternation over here. And so the difference is again zero. We expect zero roots in this interval. If b is equal to zero, and c is negative, then we know that this term here has to be positive, so it's going to be negative zero, positive, 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 and so we get one sign change over here and zero sign changes over here for a difference of one, so there's going to be one root between zero and infinity. If b is negative and c is positive, then it actually depends on what sign we have here, right? We have a positive, negative, something, and positive, positive, something. Uh, and it really depends on what we get here. Um, so we break this apart into three cases. If b squared over 4 minus c is greater than 0, then we have positive, negative, positive, and positive, positive, positive. And so we have uh, two interchanges uh, here and zero sign changes here for a difference of two. If b squared over 4 minus c is equal to zero, we have positive, negative, zero, and positive, positive, zero for a difference of one. And if b squared over 4 minus c is less than zero, then we have positive, negative, negative, and positive, positive, negative. Uh, so one sign change over here and one sign change over here for a difference of zero. And finally, if b is less than zero and c is less than zero, um, then it's necessarily going to be negative, negative, positive versus positive, positive, positive for a difference of one. And the really neat thing is that if you sat down with the quadratic formula and tried to work this out, uh, you'd get exactly the same counts of roots between zero and infinity, right? If you looked at the quadratic formula and you tried to count, uh, when is the positive term that we get from the quadratic formula uh, uh, greater than zero? And when is the negative term greater than zero? And tried to count how many of those were greater than zero, well, these are the counts that you would get, and these are the cases where you'd get those counts. And this technique generalizes to arbitrary intervals and arbitrary original polynomials, and it gives you the exact count 
Again, you need to be a little bit careful if one of the endpoints is a root, but uh, other than that, it gives you exact counts of distinct roots. Uh, in this case, the two roots are the same, and it only counts them once. So it doesn't, it doesn't count with multiplicity, which is a thing that you sometimes want. And so what this means is that if we have a logical formula that looks like, does there exist an x such that x squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero and uh, x is strictly greater than zero, Right, that's the question we're asking. Is there a root to this polynomial uh, that's greater than zero? And actually we're, we're getting the number of roots, but we only care if there is a root. Then we can take this formula here, right? It has uh, x is a bounded variable and b and c are free variables. And it translates it into a conjunction of a bunch of cases, right? Uh, b is greater than zero and c is less than zero or b is equal to zero and c is less than zero or b is less than zero and c is greater than zero and uh, b squared over four minus c is either greater than or equal to zero or b is less than zero and c is less than zero. It, it took this formula here and turned it into uh, a Boolean combination of equalities and inequalities involving B and C. Exactly a zeroth order formula in our first order logic of the reals. Of course, this doesn't address the case where we're interested in whether or not there exists an X that makes one polynomial equal to zero and another polynomial greater than zero. That's a completely separate case, and we have to use a little bit of calculus in order to figure it out. But don't be afraid of calculus showing up in your quantifier elimination algorithm, uh, because we were perfectly happy to take the derivative of a polynomial in, in this case. So I've only shown you a part of the quantifier elimination algorithm, uh, but I think it's a really neat part. This is something that I never knew about before and uh, was really curious about. Again, not all structures have quantifier elimination, but when we have structures that do have quantifier elimination, or by adding just a little bit to the structure, we can give them quantifier elimination, suddenly they become much easier to study, right? If we want to study uh, first order logical formulas over the reals, we only need to study uh, Boolean combinations of equalities and inequalities involving polynomials over the reals, which is quite a task, but it's reasonable. We have good intuitions about what the solutions to real polynomial equations and inequalities look like in arbitrary dimensions. It's worth noting that within model theory, there are actually two sides to quantifier elimination. There's um, knowing that a particular structure has quantifier elimination, that we can take any formula and turn it into a corresponding quantifier-free formula, and knowing an algorithm for doing that particular process. There are some very abstract ways of establishing that a particular structure has quantifier elimination, um, but they don't really tell us what we really want to know, which is how do we decide if a particular formula is true or false? How do we turn a formula into a corresponding quantifier-free formula? I find it much more enlightening to have a sense of what the actual quantifier elimination process looks like. But sometimes for our purposes, we just want to know that a particular structure has quantifier elimination, and we don't worry too much about what the actual algorithm is. And again, there are easier ways of showing that particular structures have quantifier elimination that don't involve working out the complete details of the algorithm that actually does the elimination. So thanks for watching. In the next video, I want to apply quantifier elimination to Pressburger arithmetic. What do we need to add to Pressburger arithmetic in order for it to have quantifier elimination? And what can that tell us about the uh, predicates that we can define in first order logic over Pressburger arithmetic? So if you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below, and I hope to see you then.